So she decides to beam Chakotay, Tuvok, and Harry Kim onto mostly destroyed cube where this bio vessel is chilling. And it's like, eh, go check it out. Fucking stupid as hell. Well, hold on. So this is where I really started taking issue with the fact she lays onto Chakotay, hey, I want you to go in this this hall of death in the scariest part in the Chernobyl of the Delta Quadrant, basically, at this point, right? Right. And there's just no look of fear on his face or Tuvok's face or or anybody. And and that's going to be my biggest complaint, my second biggest complaint for this entire episode is for the subject material and the scale that they are working on here, everybody should be shitting bricks. Their jumpsuits should be soaking wet with sweat and everybody should be pissing themselves and there's just this nonchalant. <laughs> sure, yeah, Federation uh, antidepressants, maybe, but this is such grave subject material we're dealing with, and it doesn't get communicated at all because the actors or the characters don't care about it, and as a result, I don't care about it. If they had just explained it, it's like they're all fucking excited. They're like, "We got to know who these people are because we have to send them a fruit basket." Like some kind of like reason for they're doing this other than just pure curiosity. Anything. Instead, it's just we have we got to know because we're people that we want to know things. So, you know, what go, else? go know it. And and this is. Starts coming in my head. Q in the gray. When Q is just hanging around harassing everybody on Voyager about how he can get in Catherine Janeway's pants. And you've got Harry Kim and convict Tom mouthing off like all the casual interaction people had with q the guy who introduced the federation to the borg in the delta quadrant wouldn't that have been it's been a stellar time to have some sort of conversation about what's out there and what to be expected i mean i guess the q's already done that so like that's the one thing i would have expect them never to go back to is the whole point of q introducing which they name check they name check that q yeah. introduced yeah. the federation to the borg specifically in this episode is that uh, he expects humanity to figure this out for themselves. And he's like the one guy who would not bail them out of a Borg problem, which I get, right? Like, he expects humanity to have to overcome this on their own. And I like that. Like, I like that that they maintain that continuity. I guess your point, though, brings up why they have a nonchalant attitude. Like, Tom and Harry gave no shits about taking, a, taking the piss out of a god. Like, they're yeah. just like, fuck you, dude. Stop stop harassing us about how you want to fuck our boss. Like go go to hell. You're fucking disgusting. <laughs> right? Like well shit. If talking talking shit direct to Q's face don't bother them, I guess the idea of waltzing around a destroyed cube should be easy. <laughs> like these guys are already fucked up, right? Yeah. I this should have take any episode that they've shown uh, any sort of concern about anything in the past. None of that is present here and it just it really bothers me. This is Voyager taking the building blocks of the modern 24th century and essentially reordering everything where we're talking about some real world, not building world destroying, I guess. So that's, that's why we're putting the, the effort in on this because certainly the writers didn't. So Tuvok, Harry and Chakotay beam over to the cube. Now to say good things about the episode, the cube looks good. I don't know if they upgraded their props for phaser rifles. They looked good. They they have that sort of like bug hunt alien feel while they're on the cube. They did a pretty decent job of that. There's a tension going on in these scenes. It was it was good. Uh, the it's dark. All the fucking drones are just like half fu- all kind of like just fucked up. Um, they. They find like one of the drones trying to assimilate the actual like bio ship and it's not working. And they tell poor Harry Kim, hey, buddy. Chicote and I, you know, Tuvox like Chicote and I are going to go in this bio ship and, you know, transgress and whoever's property this is, because that seems like a great fucking idea. How about you stay out here by yourself on a board cube? With a bunch of drones wandering around, they'll download a bunch of information from the computer. They love when you do that. Yeah, there'll be there'll be no backup. You have no one watching your six. So if like a 
if a drone like takes exception to that and just like sneaks up behind you, you're gonna be completely fucked. And um, you know, we'll come get you when we're done. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty like, much. If they had, if if they had done this to Neelix, total makes total sense. But what did Harry Kim do? <laughs> what did Harry Kim do to be given? He died in service of Voyager trying to establish emergency force fields uh, on breached hull sections and was sucked into space. He died. He'd already died once for this crew. Yeah, don't make him die again. Neelix is a is a one lunged space cat. Put him out there. He turned his back on a life of luxury and three wives on the Teresian pleasure colony. I mean, this is a company man we're talking about, not someone who deserves to be thrown to the fucking Borg wolves. I will I will say shout out to our trauma support people. Uh, we, we had a brief, we'll call it contest of uh, since we didn't see last episode what Harry Kim's playthrough was like uh, in the uh, co-worker murder simulator. <laughs> uh what, what what did harry kim do and uh to my great joy everyone jumped on the idea that either he's such a goody two-shoes that he basically tries to tattle to janeway the moment that he gets off the uh the elevator at the beginning of the simulation uh or he, because of his experience with uh the sex vampires he's become a total yeah the Teresians, he's become a total sex deviant <laughs> and Cause like he had like a hard R, you know, playthrough because hollow Seska like promised him butt stuff, <laughs> you know, like, or something weird. Like I like that, that it's either one of those two and everybody kind of like jumped on that. I'm like, these are our people, Peter. <laughs> they they're on our level. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, creepy. They encounter on the ship the aforementioned pile of Borg parts. Now, this was a scene that Kess got telepathically earlier in the episode, and it is a pile of dismembered Borg built up around a cone. What are your thoughts on this, Joe? Well, I think that they were trying to set up with this. Like, I think their intention was, we're going to make Species 8472, Spoiler alert, that's who this is. Into this group that's worse than the Borg, so we have to make them more eviler. Malevolent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna have them have this like weird, like you know, skulls for the skull throne, blood for the blood god monument in the middle of the cube just because they're awful. Because the the Borg are sp- space techno zombies that turn you into one of them. So what's worse than that? Uh, okay. Well, these guys are just so merciless that they just turn what they kill into these, these awful, uh, you know, uh, little displays of their monstrosity or something. So I think what they're going for was that the Borg are evil, but it's just business to them. And these things it's personal. Yeah. But I guess I think that's right. This board part sculpture looks like absolute shit. And for something that's supposed to inspire dread, I looked at it. I said, this is some of the worst physical effect display that we've seen on Voyager. And did you read what this was in reality? No. Oh, you didn't? I did not. You're not going to fucking believe. So this episode cost a ton of money and they spent it all on what we're going to find out is the worst fucking CGI we've seen since Macroism. CGI that was so bad I made my wife turn it off when we were in Florida. <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. But this pile of what I thought at first was just mannequins with Borg stuff on them that they stacked up that looked like shit. It's not that. Joe, this TV show took Playmates action figures, cut them up, and put them in a pile on a green screen, and then superimpose them into the scene while the actors walked around talking about uh, how gruesome it was. And it's fucking action figure heads and hands. And arms I believe it. I'm looking at legs. a photograph of it now because if you start talking, that's exactly what it looks like. It is. We're talking about eight dollar action figures that they just cut up for fucking international TV. The the airing numbers. Apparently, Britain loves it. Some Star Trek Voyager, which might explain why we've got <laughs> some of the yeah, we people got a lot of we've got a lot of foreign 
<laughs> listeners specifically from Britain. Yeah, which we're, we're happy to have you. But yeah, yeah that's good. that's what you guys are getting for your money over on the BBC. You're getting Playmates action figures, which I love. They're my favorite action figures. Don't get me wrong. But fucking action figures for international TV. What the fuck? So it's not the scariest thing by a long shot. But um, an- another letdown for me in this episode is we've spent three seasons now showing all the different species in the Delta Quadrant. And yes, the majority of them look very similar to human without being human, with the exception of the sad sacks and a handful of others. There's always either, you know, dry deli meats in the hair or shit on the nose or weird ears or whatever. But man, all these Borg are just human dudes. No K's on, no urinal puck people, no shitheads. Like, This is their backyard, man. Show me some degree of variation. Flesh them out a little bit, but it's uh, it's just more first contact zombie humans. You know, that's what they have action figures of, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) The only ones they made, right? Is that a no no, no fucking Klingons? You know, whatever. Simulated Seska action figure. What? Yeah, that would be awesome. I also want to say the the danger here for the crew because they're like, oh, it's not a big deal. You've got all these half functional drones that are basically stranded in space now. Like while they didn't give a shit about Voyager because they had bigger fish to fry, these dudes are all stranded and your technology and your ship to get back to the collective probably seem pretty yummy right now. Like I, I would say this is a really, really 10 out of 10 on the bad idea for multiple reasons. So Kess gets another premonition while they're investigating all of this that uh the away team is in trouble and gets like this vision of a, a a very uh in pain harry kim and while this vision occurs while on this this bio ship is what it is you know tuvok and chico they're poking around they, they identify like it seems to be this an organism almost that's got technological biotechnological uh parallels to uh normal technology and they find a a, a drone that seems to be infested with some kind of disease it's uh basically like just a really terrible like fungusy like growth all over like nasty just all the fuck over it's pretty fucking bad and that that's when harry comes in and is like yo uh i've got my fucking alien scanner out and i'm getting bleeps you know they've got their smart guns yeah and fucking Vasquez comes in and it's like, we got, we got fucking action. They try to beam back over, but whatever is approaching is, uh, got some kind of, uh, bio uh, interference aura. And they of course conveniently cannot beam them back at the moment. So we have the intense aliens bug hunt moment. And, uh, that's when we finally see, the antagonist of the episode and how would you describe our first nightmare vision of species a472 what do these guys look like to you peter because i know they haunted you once now that you've gotten another look at them roll this back they're going to get on the ship they catch another drone who's trying to jam his little assimilation probes into the organic hull of this ship right so he can inject um borg pixie dust in there and assimilate this thing but it's not happening. This this Borg's like boot looped. And this becomes very important later on. While they're mucking around in the ship, did you catch the captain's chair that is a white chair with Christmas lights all over it? <laughs> I did. The Christmas lights chair is important because this fucking alien cannot sit physically in that chair. That's how goofy this episode is. You're building sets for things that, that cannot sit in their own chairs. Uh, this thing pops out of the fucking wall and it looks like a cutscene out of 1990s XCOM video game. Not the good one from 2009. No, no. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't a good one back then for a little, you know, Bethesda studio or I'm, I'm sorry, Firaxis, my bad. Yeah, Firaxis made XCOM. This looks like some some bullshit CG cutscene garbage out of a video game not a fucking tv show where they just paid good money and to put this in perspective this is 97 you know what else came out that year men in black which had fucking awesome looking aliens and as my wife pointed out 
all of this stuff came after Jurassic Park. There is no excuse for anything to have super terrible CGI. I get that you might have a limited budget and that to get the really, really good stuff like Men in Black, you're going to have to put down big money. But there needs to be a line in the sand where people say, this isn't ready at this price point. This looks bad. This looks stupid. Let's just go with a dude in a trash bag because it's going to be better than what we ended up getting here. And these fucking things, it looks like Mewtwo as a centaur. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good explanation. Mewtwo as a centaur. It's got the Mewtwo face, weird hind leg thing. It's, it's fucking massive. It's It's got these giant forehead, like giant forehead with ridges. Protoss, maybe? Yeah, like the Protoss have a similar feel. The Ravagers from XCOM actually also have a similar look look to them and how they move around with like knife hands. Yeah, it's species 8472. Look it up. You can see what we're talking about. And it uh, it attacks Harry and manages to tag him in the chest with his knife hands. And finally, Balan is able to beam them out by locking onto their skeletal structures. I don't know, like that that was a thing that somehow no one ever thought of. I find that very hard to believe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, whatever. This this bioship, obviously, not liking that people decided to like fucking not take their shoes off before they came in, you know, because they're they're a fucking Asian ship, you know? Mm-hmm. Takes off after Voyager. And this is where it just gets stupid as hell for me. So this ship, as we will see explicitly later is ungodly powerful, right? It's implied that it has just destroyed all 15 of these cubes. We will see what a few of these ships can do together at, before this episode's over. And this thing draws a bead on Voyager and slams it with a the very beam that we saw it obliterate in a single shot a Borg cube earlier, right? Exact same thing. And it just bounces off Voyager shields and they just kind of get away. Their shields don't even go down. Yeah, this is like, We're fucking fine. ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Th- this entire exchange of events is garbage. There is no sense of dread or terror on anybody's face. Harry just probably got killed. You're not seeing any sort of physical acting on any of the people surrounding him that would relay that. This is a life and death situation while Janeway and Balan are on the ship trying to, you know, invoke the transport out clause that she promised the away team. Janeway seems super nonchalant about the thing. The CGI looks whack as fuck. This is the same exact scene when I was taking a nap in Florida. Casey turned on Voyager for me and I woke up. I saw this god awful thing and I said, turn this the fuck off. She remembered that. <laughs> she said, and I pause and she's like, isn't this that episode you told me to turn off because it looked terrible? I'm like, yes. And then she said, like, didn't Men in Black come out the same year? And I was like, yes, that's a very good point. But (laughs) you you can take all the bad acting. You can take all the bad special effects. You can throw that all in there. On the script, even even crazier bad stuff is happening. 15 cubes. 15 cubes could probably kill Q. And (laughs) Yeah. And the thing that just punched a hole through every one of them, Voyager just takes like a little toddler that you had swatted on the ass and just stumbles away laughing. And and I don't even know what cockamamie shit they come up with that they're able to just jump off into warp and get out of there, at, you know, in, in the nick of time. I'm so checked out at this point because they've gone so far off the rails. Like my big takeaway from all of this is when Voyager gets flung and like everybody's stuck on the floor, I see that Tom's chair is in fact actually bolted down to the floor and not loose on rollers. Like that was my big moment of discovery and awe and wonderment all of this because everything else is so stupid. I really try hard not to be that guy when it comes to my Star Trek fandom because there are some fans, you know them, I know them, we've encountered them in real life, we've encountered them on the internet that take fucking details too far right that are not willing to suspend their disbelief even a little bit and while we enjoy continuity and a, and a sense of real science fiction and believability in the show uh you know we as fans i think reasonable fans are willing to accept things that work for a tv show that may not perfectly line up right and i i take that i think a little farther than you if i'm being honest like i'm willing oh, to absolutely. forgive more 
like you're very forgiving i i i, I would say i'm definitely in the first camp where i will nitpick things mercilessly but yeah there is just a point where i have to just be like you know what fuck it it's tv wash my hands we're ramrodding this let's go ahead i'm very forgiving of this but this goes way too far for me the very first scene of this episode you set up this weapon and these guys as being so powerful that that shot that we just saw hit Voyager disintegrated an entire Borg cube in one shot. And Voyager, while it is no doubt a state-of-the-art Federation vessel, just shrugged off an assault that destroyed a Borg cube, which we understand to be a weapon that would absolutely take Voyager to the woodshed. It's just, just fucking stupid. It's like, I can't... The only way, the only way I can put this onto scale is this is essentially in uh, The Last Jedi when uh, Laura Dern discovers that you can just ram a ship at yeah, hyperspace, hyperspace through, through, through ships. And it's like, yeah. well, what does this do to the power scale? Of, n- none of this makes any sense. Like, that's that's the full blue screen of death brain lock moment that this conveys to me. So... I, I don't know how much cocaine was going through the writer's room at this point that this just slipped through the fucking cracks, but ridiculous. And there's not an explanation either. You know, I'm going to cut to the chase. There is no dialogue. There is no discussion. There is no explanation given for why Voyager is able to not die here. Uh, they get shot. It bounces off. They go to warp and this bio ship's like, that's fine. You can go. Right. It just doesn't follow them. There's no explanation of any of that. We cut back to actually, I think, one of the two good parts of the episode. And that is uh, what happened to Harry Kim. Bukaki is what happened to Harry Kim. (laughs) So this is probably the most metal shit I have ever seen in terms of medical real talk uh, in Star Trek. So they, they come back to him and Harry Kim is clearly conscious. He is notedly specifically said to be conscious. And he's got the green shit growing all over him. And he's got like an infected chest wound. And he looks gnarly as fuck, right? They do a pretty good job with the makeup on him. And the doctor explains what's happening. He's saying, what's happening is those are alien cells. Do you see them there? They're literally eating his body from the inside out. And the, the, these alien cells are so voracious in rejecting and destroying anything that I'm doing to prevent it. I can't even sedate him. So he, they make it clear that Harry Kim has to sit there fully conscious in horrific pain as his entire body is slowly consumed by alien super aids. Holy shit. What a dilemma to have a crew member deathly ill and days, hours, who knows what from, from death if only there was some wild technology where you could put people into a cryostasis where they would oh god (laughs) joe what if i were to tell you (laughs) that through the power of space clowns such magic (laughs) was possible jekyll of mind prison will always be your go-to yeah 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 I, I Maybe, think, like, you know what? I, I, it answers all the questions and riddles of Voyager. I would accept it if they said, you know what? Species 8427 didn't blow up Voyager because they detected fantastic technology they wanted access to. So they just hit him with a little a little stun setting. They didn't dare destroy that sweet juggalo tech. Yeah, Harry's Harry's fucked. And uh, I'm sure some quality time with Charles McGill would be much better than having your face eaten by rabid radioactive alien snap but uh for so, right now he's effed we we get the the download from the from the doctor like whatever these uh eight, species 8472 is which is what volana finds out they're called after accessing the data that harry pulled off of the board computer um is they're very biologically dense they just have a shit ton of dna 100 times more than a human cell they just regenerate everything super fast so there's nothing biological, chemical, uh, or technological that they can do to affect it. Like these are these guys have like super cells. Everything they do is crazy. 
the doctor's solution to this is to use some pixie dust that he has modified that if he's able to build up enough of these uh, of pixie dust uh, will be used to eradicate the infection. They can reprogram nanoprobes uh, to kind of like sneak in under the cell's radar and then start destroying them. He doesn't explain adequately why it, that would work when no other technological solution will work. But as as we are alluding to here, Peter, everything to do with fucking nanoprobes ends up being bullshit anyway. So we uh, we're starting off with a bang. This is the blueprint of the entire episode. This is going to be the aha moment that gives Jane with ammunition. She's going to need to push forward into her cockamamie. The plan. worst, the worst idea in the entirety of the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, yes. the the very worst. Yeah, the the idea that imperils all life. Yeah, Kess has had telepathic contact with species eight four seven two, and he that the the, the me, that member of the species said the weak shall perish, the weak will perish. Like that's the message that the the species member had for Kess that it communicated with her telepathically and said that okay that's space incredibly Mew important. Space Mewtwo's got a real bad attitude. All right, Space Mewtwo's is kind of mean. Okay, <laughs> a little nasty. All right, so Harry has super aids. This ship blew up fifteen cubes, and of course they find out all of these uh, apparently super ships are coming out of the area of space they were intending to go to, the quote-unquote Northwest Passage, right? And they know, like, oh, this is this is crazy. What the fuck do we do about this? We can't very well go in there. They seem to be coming out of quantum singularities. So they're coming out of black holes. And um, Cass... Some real space hell shit going on. Yeah, like, this is nuts, right? Like, there's a rift in, in space where there are black holes that you know, fucking super aliens are coming out in their bio ships and wiping out the Borg. This is crazy, right? This is nuts. This is like a 36 out of five on the crazy shit scale. Like our, our very worst enemies in the entirety of the galaxy are getting absolutely wrecked by a uh, bipedal knife handed, no, uh, not bipedal. They're like quad pedal, yeah, quad pedal, knife handed, a uh, centaur aliens, you know, from the great unknown. Okay, got it. And Kess tells the captain, like, yeah, uh, they've been communicating with me further. Um, they, she feels m- m- like evil and coldness and malevolence, and that they're carrying out this invasion to destroy everything. All right, this is what Kess says. Again, this is incredibly important. All right, Kess is saying this is all what ha- I'm getting. Chakotay and Janeway have another talk. This is after a crew meeting where everybody's kind of doubtful on things. Chakotay lays it out like it's I think it's time. I think it's time we have the talk. And um, it's time for us to fucking just bounce. This is nuts. Everything that's going on here is so far beyond our ability to do anything about what the fuck are we even doing? Like you we've got these these crazy new guys beating up on the crazy old guys. They are, everyone is leagues above us technologically. There's no reason for us to be involved. We're going to die to somebody if we keep this up. So I say we turn this shit around and go warp nine the other direction. And it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. It just means we're not going this way. Fuck it. Fuck all this. And Janeway's like, uh, maybe, I don't know. Thinking about it. I don't want to tell everybody that we might have to wind up staying in the Delta Quadrant. And Chakotay's like, can you just, can you just sleep on it? Like, you haven't slept in two days. Think about this. This is fucking crazy. We cannot be doing this shit. Why don't we talk about it in the morning? And Janeway says, okay. And so instead of going to sleep, of course, she goes to her stupid Da Vinci holodeck simulation and talks to John Reese Davies. And has a, you know, like, props to John Reese Davies. He does his best, right? He's doing this, this great, like, hammy scene, you know, like, soonery chewing Leonardo da Vinci, right? He's just going for it. And, you know, ch- ch- putting a little Italian phrases into everything. He's being John Reese Davies, right? Like he's just got that way about how he acts that yeah, I just buy it. I just buy him as old, old fat, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Sure. And 
you staying in universe of like praying and finding an appeal to God and all this other stuff about what to do with a difficult problem. And Janeway suddenly is struck with this inspiration that in fact, she should not pray to Jesus. She should make, go make a deal with the devil. (laughs) Red, red flags. Maybe, maybe someone is a little, uh, a little sleep deprived. I, let me toss this out on the table because we get a lot of these through Star Trek, these epiphany moments on the holodeck when people are by themselves. Do you think that there is something in the programming of all of these hollow simulations, like at a Starfleet top brass level? It's like, you know, we got a lot of people, especially the captains. They might not feel like they've got anybody they can confide in. It's possible they might be running these inspirational holodeck programs where they're talking to Isaac Newton or Leonardo da Vinci, like let's really just up the inspirational speech potential on these programs. Like that we can just heuristically monitor when people are in a really bad, depressing spot. So we can just kind of give them that, that nudge in the right direction they need with a, with a little holographic cheerleader action. I I would love to, you know, maybe lower decks. (laughs) Like that's going to be a show that's, potentially will unlock this for us right so excited so yeah. excited. <laughs> like if any show that they're gonna do might go down that road of like delicate heuristic programming in hollow matrices to make sure that they're sufficiently inspiring to starfleet captains about to deal with a mm-hmm. difficult choice i can yeah. buy it um so what follows is janeway going back to the senior staff and saying here's my plan my plan to get us through this is to make an alliance with the Borg. Because clearly, homies have a problem. They're getting their shit wrecked by Species 8472. However, the doctor, in trying to find a way to treat Harry Kim's super aids, has stumbled across a way to reprogram Borg space pixie dust to actually be effective against this biomass crap that species eight, four, seven, two is about. And I think in, in the only clever take in the writing is like, they're never going to figure it out for themselves because the Borg don't innovate. They assimilate. So the only way they're ever going to find this out is if they take it from us and we'll just program that information directly into the doctor's hollow matrix and delete them. If they threaten us, which the doctor goes, why I why like you're going to do what? <laughs> Like, what? There's so much bad going on here. I, I want to try and stop and salvage the, like you said, the one good thing I think they really do in world building here. Balana says, yeah. this is something that we have been able to observe because we observe. It's not that the board can't make new technology. It's that they cannot understand anything that they do not assimilate. They have never encountered anything they cannot assimilate, and they have lost the ability to impartially observe and learn without going hands-on and this has created a fatal flaw and i thought about this for a while if it seemed like too much of an oversight but we jump back to next gen when data put an entire cube into a sleep cycle and that's kind of the cool part about the borg like they are so big and so massive but there's these little gaps that can have catastrophic results from so yes the, the borg losing the ability to just observe as a third party and it makes me, again, think about how the board works. If it is just a, a consistent consensus of everybody weighing in with what they believe is right, and the Borg at the end is just this cold calculating machine, and there might be parts in the, the, the collective that say, you know, we should be able to uh, continue to have the ability to, to observe, but it's just drowned out by the, the oppression of democracy. That's a really cool flaw for them to build in. And it's a great reason why Voyager is able to formulate a very basic uh, reapplicate repurpose of their own technology. Everything else here is fucking ridiculous. It is. It is. But I want to I want to say while we were, were focusing on this, one of the few bright spots is that if they decided to build an episode of them dealing with the Borg where this was the crux of their ability to get past them that they're they they cannot innovate they because of of their nature 
and that gives them enough of an advantage in a situation to that they can get past them. I I would have been all about that because I do think that is good continuity and it makes sense for what the Borg are without making them less scary. However, it's done in service of bullshit and therefore I cannot like it. Her whole plan hinges on the ace up my sleeve is that uh, we will destroy the technology before they can get it so they don't get it. The entire crew is going to be dead. Who gives a fuck? So the whole crew should be like ready to mutiny at this point. Chakotay is going to have his words with her in a little bit, but and I'll lay the blame on the entire crew at this point. Nobody stops to say we need to back the fuck out of this. Our mortal enemy, the Borg, has finally found something that is not decimating, but just ravaging it. What? Why would think about what you're saying? Think about all the people that the Borg have fucked. And this eight, four, two, seven stands a chance of shutting them down. And you're talking about going in and giving them a weapon to not just beat the species, but maybe even assimilate it and become completely unstoppable like chakotay says all that so let's get into it everyone leaves no one has much to say janeway points out chakotay didn't say anything during the meeting and he goes yeah because i'm i'm rudy ray moore and i'm wondering bitch are you for real this is the stupidest thing i've ever heard and he actually touches on kind of what you started to get into which is these guys are beating up the borg we don't know anything about them. And it's true. All they have is Kess's brief telepathic contact with some number of them, right? They're willing to, to negotiate, and they're obviously willing to let Voyager just go, right? Just let them run away. They're, they're, they're not their priority, whatever they are. There's indications that at a minimum, while they might be aggressive, they can potentially be reasoned with, right? And... Right now, they're busy going ham on the Borg. And Chakotay even brings up, the Borg have killed billions of people. They are absolutely the worst fucking thing that we know of in this galaxy. They are this un almost unstoppable force that mows down opposition, strips it of its individuality, and brings it into itself. And we've got these guys that have come in and are just desperately taking it to them and whooping their asses. And as I said from before, like Janeway should be on her hands and knees thanking them for doing such a favor to all of reality. And the idea that Janeway is suggesting, I want to give the Borg technology that would allow them to destroy the only thing that we have ever seen that looks like can challenge them and be and, and overcome them so that I can get home is so frighteningly irresponsible. The fact that yet she has this data of like, Oh, they have a way to beat this. Like that should be, that should, they should go to species eight, four, seven, two and be like, Hey, yo, we kind of stumbled across this on accident. We have no intention of communicating this with them. We are on, we are on team species eight, four, seven, two, get them fucking get them. Like you guys are going to be goddamn heroes in this quadrant. Maybe we can convince you to just not kill everybody else and just beat up on the board or something like that should be her move, right? Like why the fuck isn't she like in, in right with Chakotay and Tuvok and Tom and be like, and Neelix and be like, we need to find out a way to talk to these guys. We need to we need to figure out some way of communicating with effectively get Kess in here and just like beam out through Kess like a telepathic peace and love and harmony thing and let them know like we're on your side. You're doing God's work like that. that why is that never entertained? Like all they have is like, oh, this one guy is like the weak shall perish and a few others that she's picked up. They're like real fucking. Yeah, it's mean. just a jarhead grunt, man. He's <laughs> they're bred for being crazy. You got to talk to the smart grays. Yeah. Um, the notion that 148 people getting home is worth the fate of the entire galaxy. You know, let's let's talk big picture here. The Borg are going to win. The Borg on a long enough timeline are going to expand their borders to consume everything around them. They are going to get into the Alpha Quadrant and they're going to take everybody down one system at a time. There's 15 cubes in one engagement with one ship. How many are there total? The 
the reconnaissance that Voyager has just conducted on their long distance probes where they find thousands of systems and, and, and thousands of planets, fully populated planets of Borgs, like that is worst case scenario. Because again, when the, when you initially encountered the Borg in next gen, maybe the Borg were just one cube and that's all these guys. Who knows? We, we don't know what they have. Now you see the full scope of what these things are and what's waiting for the rest of it. So Janeway's not talking about giving them a, uh, a piece of technology to win a war. She's saying, let's give these guys permission. Let's give these guys security to just simply exist. We're not going to win a war from uh, we, this is the Federation saying it is okay for the Borg to kill the entire universe. And we are going to, at this moment in time, fuck everybody indefinitely yes like they know how bad the borg is they've talked about in this episode how bad the borg is they make sure that you the viewer are reminded of how bad the borg is and then they still have janeway make this decision with no attempt and no thought given to the idea of maybe we should make a better effort to get on this good side of the species 8472 let's go into fluid let's go into the 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 northwest passage let's talk to these guys any way we can and like convince them like whatever i we hey we got off on the wrong foot we will we, we will show the belly we'll bend the knee you guys are the fucking tits this is amazing you have no idea how happy we are that this is happening now i will say that based on kess's you know interaction with the weak shall perish it is reasonable to assume that 8427 is not going to stop 8472 you keep doing that. It's eight four seven two. The space mutus. The space are, mutus are not going to quit. So I get it on that, but you know for goddamn sure what the Borg are about. That the Borg have an expansion thing. You know, for all they know, the Borg could have been fucking around with new technology, and they're like hornets, and they basically accidentally not accident, but you know they they went into the space mutus hornet nest and pissed them off, and now they're paying the price. But you know for damn well sure what the Borg are all about. Um, I will say for the record that I really liked Beltrain's performance here. While he didn't do a good oh, yeah. job conveying fear at any point um, towards any of the life-threatening situations, the conflict he develops with Janeway here and the Scorpion speech I thought was really good and extremely appropriate uh, from a soft touch native pair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we... We get a it's a best case from. scenario, man. It's a best case scenario. We do get a little, uh, a little waft of the, uh, of the, uh, the hand peyote, the, the Indian, uh, the Indian, uh, bullshit flute. It's, it's a pretty famous parable of like, you know, like the Borg are going to fuck us, Kathy. That's what they do. They're the Borg. They simulate things. So no matter what they tell you, that's so what they're going to trying to do. Back yeah, to mutiny. Look, we're not talking about just the 148 lives on the ship. We are talking about the fate of the entire galaxy. Yeah, and that's what makes it, it is, so inexcusable. It is, I would say, Chakotay, Tuvok, any of senior leadership at this point's responsibility to stop her uh, from betraying everybody and giving their mortal enemy a, a pass. Yeah, I mean, I like the Chakotay is real solid in his opposition, but it's, it's almost shades of two Vix of like, why the fuck isn't anybody else saying anything? Like, mm -hmm. how is it that Chakotay is the only one saying, why are you giving the arch nemesis of the Milky way galaxy, the destroyer of life and the stripper of all individuality, the wary worst thing, the opportunity to live against something that while it might be bad, could be a lot easier to deal with. Like, that we, we might be able to negotiate with them. We, we might be able to find a way to convince them that we haven't tried. We, we get the sense that, that they might be mean or, you know, like the, they don't like the Borg. They don't like the Borg very much. Well, guess what? We don't like the Borg. You know, either. if they wanted to you know? kill us, they could have killed us because they shot us with the laser. That right, killed but they didn't. They let years. us go. Like yeah. they let us go and they could have easily killed us. So clearly there's something to work with there. And the, so far, all they've proven is they really fucking hate the Borg. Well, join the club. So does everybody else. We should be like rolling out the mat for these guys. And there just isn't any uh, effort. And there's no plausible explanation given for why they shouldn't. Other than Kess alone saying, 
I get the get feels from these guys that they're mean. They're bad dudes. You know, like Kess, who weak. also said that everybody's gonna die. So it's like Janeway's not willing to believe Kess enough that she stays the fuck away from this, but is willing to believe that you know these guys are too. And I will say that for the for the record here, two four space Mewtwo's they come off as like super two dimensional bad guys, and in that I find them very boring, and it just makes this entire situation worse. Not only are they the the absolute smartest bestest fastest most powerful but they're also born they're a fa- they're a fan fiction enemy they're like oh what's what are we gonna destroy 15 board cubes because it's just so awesome yeah. and and chakotay by the way in this scene is not saying we should go like help species 8472 he's just saying let's get the fuck out of here and let them just fight it out fuck it we'll come back later yeah, we'll hey, we spent 16 months screwing around on Little House on the Prairie. Let's go take a half a year back on that nice colony pear trees. And when we come back, maybe the Borg will be so fucked we can just get through their space easy. Who knows? Yeah, let's just head back to the border. Go to, we'll go to fucking Veracruz or whatever. <laughs> you know, just chill. And then we'll come back. Beach. Yeah, we'll just dig the beach for a while, man. Let's take let's take let's take some time for us. You know, like it, it, but no. So. Voyager goes to a assimilated planet, pretty metal, and a cube rolls up and is like, yo, three cubes. Resistance is futile. We're going to take you now. And she transmits the the deal and says, hey, so we have this technology that we've innovated off of your nanoprobes that will allow you to fight species A472. We're not going to we're going to destroy it if you don't play ball with us. And the Borg transport Janeway immediately onto the cube and say, state your demands. I would say it's like some of one, again, one of those like small little clever things to demonstrate like the Borg's situation. Where they they're very direct still, right? They're not messing. But they want what Voyager has. They just beam the captain to the cube and say, state your demands. Is this a prison situation? Is this jail cell clink worthy? Um, not yet. Could be. She's, I mean, the episode ends before it's clear if it's jail or not. Oh, by the way, uh, in the Voyager is caught in a tractor beam, too. You might remember that as the same tractor beam that cut a fucking circle in the Enterprise hull and dragged its people off to hell but uh not a good place like how how can you be on voyager at the helm and fly this ship to certain doom like again like it's it's the two box situation there is no accountability anywhere in this bridge for what is very clearly a suicide run a suicide run at the best the continued existence of the borg and the damnation of the entire universe at the worst so as Janeway is conducting her negotiation on the Borg in a poor and a very bad green screen, Species 8472 actually shows up at this planet. And then we get like one more taste of how fucking powerful these guys are. How do you top blowing up 15 cubes with one vessel? How could you possibly top Frieza slicing Namek in half with the flick of his wrist, Joe? Well, and what you have is a bunch of the ships like combining to Kamehameha, uh, a Borg planet into nothingness with one shot. So basically a bunch of the Borg, uh, the bio ships combined to form a bio ship Voltron beam and just lance the middle of the Borg planet and immediately explode it. Like all the Borg cubes around, except of course the one cube with Janeway on it that has Voyager and a tractor beam, uh, all just, just get immediately blown up. I mean, these these this ha- handful of bio ships, we know there's like 200 of these fucking things. It's like 10 of them that show up here and just wreck everything immediately and blow up the planet with, a, with a literal a death planet. with a Death Star super laser. They're like cheerleaders and they form a pyramid and blow the planet up. Star Trek versus Star Wars, man. Q aside. The Empire would mop the floor with the Federation. Agreed. Agreed. If you look at the technical manuals, the scope of Star Wars is just ridiculous. It's space fantasy. Their ships... It's not realistic, and therefore yeah. all their ships are ridiculous as well. Yeah, well, you know, terrible as Star Destroyers can just completely obliterate things, blah, 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 blah. The only real chance that anything Star Trek related has in winning in a fight with Star Wars 
are the Borg. And here you've taken the pinnacle of space terror in Star Wars, the Death Star, and you have reduced it to five ships holding hands playing Ring Around the Rosie, and they can produce the Death Star blast. That is how ridiculous this shit is. A species A472 can Care Bear stare the Borg into oblivion with no effort. A planet. It's gone. So they scoot off to some very dramatic music. And that is that. I'm just standing there shaking my head in fucking disbelief, knowing that it is going to be a two hour plus podcast of trying to decompress <laughs> on how fucking ridiculous it is. Joe, I feel that somewhere in here, there is what could have been a cool episode. I think like, can I, can I play? What if, can I try and remake this? Absolutely. We get to Borg space. It's a problem. We've known it's going to be a problem. How are we going to get through this? The Borg need a threat to the Borg's existence that is going to create a situation where Voyager is going to get to pick sides and work with the devil and make it through and somewhere along the way, pick up a very attractive liaison who is going to replace Kess. All true. Rolling out space Mewtwo's space kitties with their magic space lasers that blow planets and, and blowing the technology scale of Star Trek out of the fucking water and taking decades of careful world crafting and an excellent major motion picture and throwing it in the trash is not the answer. The answer falls back into unity. Throw a Borg civil war in there, man. Was it the, the commune? The commune, was that what it was called? Yeah, the co- a cooperative. The cooperative, which Voyager's already had heavy interactions with, is openly rebelling. We've seen it before with lore. Rogue factions within the collective trying to escape. It's causing hell. The cooperative wants help. And you know what? We've already worked with you before. Voyager, we know you want to get through this thing. If you give us some special technology that's going to give us the upper hand to really wreck the Borg shit, which is a good thing to do anyways, we can get you through this. You're not going to feel great about working with us, but it's better than the alternative, which is waiting back there. You're not introducing new assets. You're using stories you've already told. You're expanding on it. You're keeping everything in-house, and you're not getting ridiculous. I... uh I'm happy to say that they touch on some of this um, later. Uh, All these ideas that you have, eventually they start to, they start to go down those roads at the end of season three. We obviously have, you know, a lot of show left and now the Borg are a part of it from this point forward. So I don't want to say too much. I decided to say like those are ideas that go d- that they eventually. I'm just saying that what they're doing by introducing this boring ass space Mewtwo species is unforgivable. That everything they've done here is stupid. I want to read you a quote. It struck me then. This is Bram Brando. It struck me then there that first contact had come and gone. It was time to deliver the Borg in a big way. At which point we threw out the cliffhanger we were working on at the time, which was. Years later, however, Braga hesitantly recounted that moment of inspiration. I had come in, was sitting at home late one night and watching a videotape of uh, Unity. It had a board money in it or something. Like, Branagh worked on First Contact. He knew the the good stuff he had done. For them to drag this all back out and just undo all that hard work, it's just, what a mistake, man. The story was there to tell. Yeah, it was all unnecessary. There was no reason to do it this way. It was just what there wasn't any like they didn't write themselves into a corner. They just kind of just did this to themselves. They just the feel it feels juvenile. That's how that's the, I think the way I'll describe it. This plot feels juvenile and not from like a fart noise way. It feels like okay, uh, we need something. We we gotta introduce the Borg. Uh, what do we do? Well, we got to give Voyager a chance to deal with the Borg because that's the one thing we haven't done yet is them like negotiating and like with the Borg. OK, seems to go against the spirit. But what's the idea? Uh, uh, Something that's way more powerful than the Borg shows up. They just blow up like a billion cubes and blow up Borg planets. They're just like way better. And Voyager is going to cubes, five cubes, no, 15, 15 cubes. And Voyager is going to sweep in and they're going to have the answer. And, and that's that they're they're going to just they're just going to deal with the problem for them. And that's how they're going to that's how they're going to get through it. Like, 
And in the process, let's make Janeway completely fucking psychotic and everybody okay with it. Well, I mean, she's got some problems now with Chakotay that are very well deserved, but. There are future Borg episodes that I think are good. So it's not like every time they show up, it's bad. So I don't want to like leave you with too much like dread. The the Scorpion and uh there there's another two parter with the Borg that is also pretty bad. Uh, Dark Frontier, but there there's some stuff like the Unimatrix Zero. There's some episodes specifically dealing with Seven of Nine, uh, all of which do I think really interesting storytelling with the Borg, and filling them out in a way that I think doesn't. It enhances them as a as a part of the Star Trek universe. Uh, but Species 8472 as evil uh, space uh, corn worshippers that are just going to murder the Borg because they're angry. It, it's so ha- it's such a hack job. And I, I don't want to spoil anything about them either, but they realize their mistake with this later. And they actually go back and do episodes with species eight, four, seven, two, where they try and correct the problem they create for themselves. I was about to say, like, it's, think I've, I've been watching this uh, future man a lot, which is real heavy time travel and fucking amazing. If you haven't watched it, it's so funny and it really just handles time travel the right way. But like, this is the moment in history where the, the Borg ravaged remnants of the Federation look back with spite and malice at captain Janeway, the new space Hitler who has committed the worst crime possible in, in gifting, attempting to gift the Borg with continued survival. Like there should be people coming back in time to murder her before this point. Anyway, here we are two hours later. Hmm. Um, I think we're going to have to take some time to digest this one. Um, I think we'll probably end up splitting this into two episodes and then we'll do a season three rip. So, uh, we'll get, we'll get to everybody with timing, but, uh, yeah, this is a real disappointment and, um, it's, it, I think it's particularly disappointing to me because season three really started to come through at the end. Heavy. Uh, even like the midpoint, man, I, I went back and was looking at it, but, we got a lot to discuss on this thing. It's been a very busy seven months of Trek in the world of Voyager. I, I think that after they got through the, the rough patch that kind of ended with, um, I want to say like Coda, not even that, like there was, I, I guess Q in the gray, like that early part of the season, like well, let's 10 episodes. All for the, for the rip. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it then, but I think like season three started out pretty, pretty weak got better and then really hit its stride for a lot of the last, and then just ended on a wet fart, like just awful, just universe wrecking wet fart. But literally uh, when we do get back to it, what are we going to watch? When we get back in, we're going to be coming into Scorpion part one. That's going to be season four, episode one. We see, uh, the doctor and Chakotay and, uh, Harry Kim with some additional space bukkake all over his face. Voyager finds a solution to combat that to combat the invader of Borg space. All Janeway asks is free passage through their territory and she'll share the knowledge, which we already knew that damn well. I do have, however, and this has been a while since we busted one of these out, a rule of acquisition. (gasps) Go on. Frankie rule of acquisition. Number 34 war is good for business. Yeah. Especially like when you've got, you know, someone showing up and destroying your worst enemy for free. <laughs> Too bad they fucked that up. All right. Yeah. What What are the odds that uh, right as Voyager would arrive, this alien, this alien invasive force is coming and doing their thing? All right, man. All right. Thanks for listening to Vija Please, a hateful voyage through the Delta Quadrant. Follow us on Facebook at Vija Please. Follow us on Twitter at Vija Please. Email us at Vija Please at gmail dot com and uh, you know, like share subscribe to us on youtube uh you know, get it download us on uh itunes leave us reviews 
whatever you want to do to express your appreciation of of Egypt, please on the internet and spread the word about the show. We we always uh, do appreciate that. We also have a Patreon. You can find us at www.patreon.com slash Vija, please support the show. We're welcome to fraying some of the costs of bringing the show to you. And we will see you next time with a review of Scorpion Part 2.